Again, it's good to see you guys here tonight. Thank you for being here. And uh, for those who are here for the first time, thank you again for coming out and joining us. Let me give you a couple things before we jump into our study tonight. Does everybody have the handout? Does everybody have the Bible study handout? You don't have one. Okay. Where, where are the handouts at, Mark? They are out on the table. Anybody else doesn't have one? They're always out in the front, so when you come in, make sure you run by the foyer, the prayer list, and the Bible study handouts will be out there, so you, can, you don't have to miss it. Also, did, uh, I think Nicole's got everybody's name for the book giveaway. So, yeah, we, uh, for a special um, donation, she will move your name up to the top of the list. <laughs> I know some of y'all are getting frustrated with all these good, good books giving away. So what I've been trying to do uh, in this Bible study series is trying to do this series in a way that I wish somebody would have done it for me. Uh, Because I learned things kind of piecemeal. I, I learned some things just by attending a class. I learned some things in my PhD program. Uh, I learned some things just because I was hungry. I just wanted to know more. Uh, I had questions in my mind, things that did not line up, and so I got books and journal articles and called up uh, people who have been studying the Bible for years and doctors and, and um, theologians and I just talk to them and 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 kind of gain the understanding I have today and so I have been trying to teach you the way I wish somebody would have taught me kind of step by step so far we've done the first corner of the triangle now I will make that more and more clear as we go further along in in the summer I look at Bible study almost like a triangle all right one end of the triangle is the literature okay literature means the written word what does it say how do you interpret that what language was it written in what is the genre if you notice these are the things we covered in the past five weeks the literature part of the Bible today we begin the history part of the Bible okay so under history the place we're going to begin tonight is geography. If you don't know where all these things happen, you're going to have a very partial understanding of the history of the Bible. And I'm not talking about how the Bible came down to us, but how are the books written? For what purpose? What is happening? What's the scene? What are the politics? What are the religious things, the sociological things that are happening in the different sections of the Bible? So that's where history comes in under history tonight we look at geography okay and then the third end of the triangle is theology okay so language history and theology theology is the last part which we're going to probably sometime uh, end of July we're going to hit that part or middle of July we should be in in theology so once you have those three kind of ends of the triangles that's when you, you begin to understand and get the whole picture of how to study the Bible, okay? So literature, we've done the best we can so far. We finished that off. Now we come to history. Under history, we begin with geography, okay? And geography is the land. Now, tonight, so much to take in, but it's not going to be as complicated as the literature part was. But kind of hang in there, the theology part is going to get complicated. All right, so um, this is the fun stuff. This is, this is when you get the crowd back. You know, we had a big crowd, and the crowd fizzled, crowd back. And I know some of y'all are traveling, so I know why. The region, and by the way, all the notes are in front of you. Now, typically what I would do is I would put on the, on the website and then have outlines so you can fill in. And some of y'all told me, there's no way we can write this fast. So everything that I'm talking about is in front of you. I have the same notes that you have, okay? So the region in which the biblical events took place is between the Nile River. If you notice the Nile River in Egypt on the screen and 
um, the Mediterranean Sea on the west. If you see the Mediterranean Sea, the blue, all right? This is the western part of the region. And the Zagros Mountains and the Persian Gulf in the east. Now, in the map in front of you, you cannot really see it, but the Zagros Mountains are somewhere here, okay? And the Persian Gulf is down here. All right? So, that's the extent. It's all happened in the Middle East. Isn't that amazing? And that's where everything is happening. That's where all the conflicts are. That's, that's the, the hot spot of the world. Always has been, always will be. So, that's the western to the eastern, um, you know, boundary of the region in which the Bible took place. How about the northern and the southern? It begins with the Amanus Mountains up in the north and the Ararat Mountain up here in the north. And down here, this, this map doesn't say it, but the Nafud Desert, which is this area, and the southern tip of Mount Sinai, which is this. So we're looking at a region. Oop, I should be careful how I do this. Technology is wonderful, but in a moment I can lose it all. All right, so this region from here all the way to somewhere here, all this happened. The New Testament, by the way, expanded everything over a little bit into Asia Minor. This is modern-day Turkey, into Greece. That's where you have Philippi, Corinth, Athens, and then going on into Rome. That's where Paul finally ended up being. Let's talk about that a little bit. Just, this is a learning section. Hopefully it'll help you understand what we're talking about. Much of the Middle East is desert. As much as 487,000 square miles of nothing but desert. And this does not include the Negev, which is down here. If you can see where I'm pointing. Um, it does not include the Sinai Desert down here. This does not include the Egyptian desert going down here. So, a lot of desert. The bodies of water, especially the Mediterranean Sea over here, have played a big role in the biblical events. The conflict was over the fertile land by the sea coast. By the way, did you notice this? This is, it's like... Um, like the Spaghetti Junction in Atlanta. Have you all ever been to Atlanta, the Spaghetti Junction? It seems like everything is like... Folks, the reason this was the promised land, the reason God put these people right here is because you have to come through here. No matter where you're going, you have to come through here. God put them at the most strategic point for what reason? Oh, to hear about him. You are to be a, a light to the Gentiles, right? What God told Abraham, through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And at the time when God told Abraham that, the known world was not very far. This is it. This is the known world right here. You know, maybe a little further up, right up here maybe. So everything is happening right here. Isn't that amazing? The promised land is not like somewhere in a, you know, Sri Lanka or somewhere. <laughs> the promised land is, is right in the middle. You have to go through it. And the conflict was always over the fertile land by the sea coast. Different peoples came from the sea. Uh, they came, the Philistines came, okay? The Greeks came from here. The Romans came all the way from here. They all came because the land is so fertile. Not only that, but also people came towards the sea. The Amalekites came, the border people from here, because it's all desert. You've got to have crops. Where do you get crops? You've got to go where the land is fertile, where you have crops. 
So the Amalekites, the Moabites, the Edomites, all these people always came this way. Even the Israelites came there. God sent them. The Ammonites came there. Others came from far away, which is Babylon, right here, Assyria. And what happened when people came here? From here or here or here, what happened? Everybody's happy to have those people? Like, welcome, so glad you came. No, it's like, get out of here. Oh, you're not? Let's fight, you know. So that's why a lot of battles took place at this juncture. And by the way, not just biblical times, but after the biblical times. You know, uh, the Arabs came. After the Arabs, the Turks came. And after the Turks, you know, the French came. The British came. It just, just kept coming here. This is, this is the hot spot. This is the center of the earth. Some came for timber. Why timber? Because if all this is desert... You don't have tall trees. How do you build a home? How do you build a temple? How do you build anything? So you need timber. Where do you get timber? You get timber where timber grows, right? And um, building stones because it's all desert out there. Where are you going to get stones? Uh, copper, iron, tin, gold, silver. Now, not all that was found here, but parts of that is found. And plus, if it's not found, guess what? From Asia Minor which at the time was, you know, of uh, Old Testament, the Hittite kingdom, uh, they found some from Greece, whoever they were at the time from Egypt. This could be the place you could get it and take it back to wherever you wanted to take it back to, here, there, anywhere you want to take it to. Not only that, uh, this, was also, this also led to the development of roads and highways. I'm going to go to another map over here, uh, get close up a little bit. And I'll come back to this. All right, so get a little bit close up of this, this particular map. There are two major highways. See, what people think is that before us, everybody was stupid. You know, we in the 20th century, 21st century, we're so smart. Before us, people didn't know what they were doing. Folks, I think people have gone dumber through the years. Would you agree with that? Except for a handful few full that you know, come up with technology. The rest of us are kind of going downhill. There were two major highways, and they're still there. One ran up the coast. Nicole and I have been on this highway. It's known as the Way of the Sea. It goes up, up and down this way, Way of the Sea. It connects Egypt all the way to Damascus, Syria, on and on. How long has it been there? It's been there for 4,000 years. It used to be known as the way of the Philistines. And so guess which way uh, the armies marched? If they were coming from Egypt, they're marching up the way of the sea. Why didn't they go in, the, in inland? We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But I'll go and tell you, the reason they could not go inland is mountainous. Now, a handful of people, a caravan can go up there, but you can, can you take armies? Can you take elephants? Can you take all your... <laughs> equipment up the mountain no that's too much trouble so this was the way of the sea there was another major highway it was known as the king's highway we've been on that highway as well it goes from here all from here through petra all of that and it goes back up here towards syria coming down towards babylon and all that so two highways one this way one that way and many roads in between. I hope this helps you kind of get, get a picture in your mind of what, you know, where are these things happening. Along with rainwater, people have survived through the Nile River in Egypt. So this is the Nile River. By the way, which way do you think this river is flowing? Down or up? It flows up. You know, it's coming from here going up this way into the Mediterranean Sea. That's a delta. If you notice, this is a delta. Just like a Mississippi Delta, this is a delta. Why does it become a delta? Because it's coming like this, and then it kind of fans out. And all that ground is very fertile. That's why all the people go over here and settle. That's why Joseph, right, he was in Egypt. And when his family came, Pharaoh said, I'm going to give you the best land. He gave him land somewhere at this point. And that land was known as Goshen. Yeah, Goshen was somewhere here. 
perfect land. No wonder people didn't want to leave until they went into slavery and there's like, oh, we got to get out of here. All right, so uh, the Nile River fed the people of Egypt or watered the people of Egypt. And then also when you come back into Israel, which is here, the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee, this was fresh, fresh water. I hope you realize why we're talking about this and not Mediterranean. That's salt water. You can't do a whole lot with that. So this is the fresh water. And then, oh, come on back. All right. So, and then Babylon, which went through different names, Mesopotamia, Persia, or Medo-Persia, all those names. See, at different times, biblical places had different names. Just like in America, you know. What was it called before, before um, I don't know, Columbus came here in 1492? What was this place called? I don't know, that place, <laughs> you know. And then it, it got some name and then some name and, and then we talked about the colonies and then it became the Americas. So different names. So anyways, this, this part of the world was fed by the Euphrates River and the Tigris River. It was called Mesopotamia, land between rivers. Meso means middle, Potamia or Potamus means river. That's where you get the word hippopotamus. It's a river horse. Right? It's a river horse. Also, going back here, natural springs, wells, cisterns uh, have been extremely important. If you remember, Abraham's servants and you know, lots of servants would get into fights over wells. Why do you need wells? Because if you don't have wells, you're going to die. You've got to have wells. A lot of fights over wells. Especially in the early part of Genesis. The area is often referred to as the Fertile Crescent. Let me back up here. Come out of there. Come out of there. Oops. Yeah. This area is known as the Fertile Crescent. Why Crescent? Because it's almost like a moon right here. It's like it starts here, goes like this. Am I making sense? It's a crescent. It's a moon. Um, this land is fertile. And then because of the Euphrates, Tigris River, it's fertile again. All this in the middle is nothing but desert. Sometimes it's known as a sacred bridge. And, the, and modern Israel, by the way, this country right here, is only, it's in your notes, 8,522 square miles, which is roughly the size of New Jersey. That's how small it is. So what people are fighting over is the state of New Jersey, how tiny that is. And if you were to travel from the northernmost tip of Israel down to the southernmost here, we've been there, it's known as um, Eloth. It takes only maybe four hours. You can go from north to south of Israel in four hours. And how about east to west? Maybe hour and a half, 70 miles. And in some places like at this point right here, maybe I can go to a, a better, closer map. At this point right here where the West Bank begins, it's only nine miles apart. I mean, Israel really has to work hard to protect themselves. And by golly, they do an amazing job, don't they? Surrounded by people who want to destroy them, and yet they are standing, and they're still standing. So, you know, pray for Israel. So let, let's, let's start looking at this for a moment. The land in the Bible, the land of the beginning. So we're going back here. This is where it all began. Ur of the Chaldees, Mesopotamia, as I mentioned to you, land between the rivers, possible location of the Garden of Eden. Possible. Why did I say possible? Because some scholars say that even though those two rivers, Euphrates, Tigris, are mentioned coming out of the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis, some scholars say that it may be that after, you know, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, after the flood, 
these were names that were in their minds and so they gave these names to these new rivers after the flood this may not be the place where it all began I don't know there's no way we can really tell but if I had to pick I would pick somewhere in this part of the world is where it all began okay especially because Babel Babylon is right there I would say more than likely there but just want to make you aware some people don't believe that this is where Abraham came from so he did not come from Israel he came from Ur of the Chaldeans this is somewhere near to the place and they still have ruins there later by the way if I may back out of this one more time so this place is important in the book of Genesis because this is where Abraham is leaving do you think he goes straight across here why not you gotta speak loudly so I can it's desert he's gonna die so what do you think he he goes up the Euphrates River or between the Tigris Euphrates and comes up here to Haran I don't know if you can read that but that's Haran as the Bible says he comes there stays there until his father dies and then he comes down this way it all began here and what country is this now you can say it louder so I can hear Iraq this is Iraq this is modern day Iraq later on by the way this part of the world will once again take center stage it's known as the Neo-Babylonian Empire have you heard of Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible nobody has do come back because I'm gonna cover history all right. you have Nebuchadnezzar all right he is this Babylonian kingdom once again was revived and they tried to try to you know bring back old traditions and those kind of things and gods and goddesses but Babylon once again take took center stage and they came against the southern kingdom of Judah and took it away under Nebuchadnezzar so you know this place is not forgotten it came back uh, further to the east is Persia by the way it's over here and I'm sorry the map got cut off somehow why is Persia important if you remember Babylon remember King Darius who was it who, who saw the writing on the wall who was it I'll speak louder I cannot hear you uh, a bunch of shy people anyway well anyways I guess y'all don't know so anyways um, you know the writing on the wall and he is all trembling in his knees and who I cannot hear you Belteshazzar that's right that's right Darius came after that so he he saw the writing on the wall right and that same night Cyrus's soldiers his army pretty much shut down the river that was running through the city and walked in on dry ground you know they walked under the moat so to speak and they came in and overnight the Babylonian Empire fell and the Medo-Persian Empire took charge and what did Cyrus say he said all you Jewish people you can go home the policy was very different we don't want to keep you here why do we want to keep you here go home just pay your taxes that's all we want and so uh, you know the Jewish people came back what books were written over here Daniel was written Ezekiel it's all in your notes by the way you know you can cheat if you like <laughs> who Ezra Nehemiah now Nehemiah was from there but keep in mind he came back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls of the temple so part of the Bible was not written in Israel it was written over here in Persia how about Esther Persia okay so this is something very interesting now let's go back to the promised land for a second we already looked at Ur of the Chaldeans we've looked at Babylon 
come back to the promised land, referred to as Canaan. Why Canaan? Because the Canaanites lived there incorporating the modern states of Lebanon, Syria, Israel, and Jordan. So at the time when you said Canaan, you're talking about Israel right here. You're talking about Lebanon up here, Syria, and Jordan. So pretty big track of land. It is divided into five major longitudinal zones. What does that mean? Very simple. It means there's the coastal plain, Coming up and down here, coastal plain. Then you have the central mountain range. This is why, uh, make it interesting for you, Armageddon. Nicole and I went to that place, Armageddon. You know Armageddon comes back in the end. All right. And they say, we don't know for sure. Sometimes I think they kind of exaggerate. They say about 26 layers of cities were built on the same spot. I don't know. I would say maybe 15. But still, that's a lot. Armageddon is somewhere at this point. Does that, can y'all see my arrow? Okay. Why was it built there? Why was Armageddon so important? Why were, if I say 15 layers of cities built, even though they say 26, why was it so important? Because this was the only place there was an opening for you to go from west to east or from east to west. It's all mountainous. So whoever had Armageddon controlled the trade, the taxes. So the Egyptians controlled it. The Assyrians controlled it. Babylonians tried to control it. The people of Israel tried to control it. Whoever controlled it controlled the money because you have nothing but mountains in the middle. What do you have on the, on the next side? You have here... The Rift Valley. The Rift Valley, I mean, this is deep. That's where you have the Dead Sea. You see this body of water right here? That's the Dead Sea. It's the lowest point. And um, it's just a rift. I mean, earthquakes, this is, this is that deep rift running the Jordan Rift. And then on the right-hand side is the fourth, is the Transjordan, Transjordanian Mountains. So you have mountains on this side, big rift, valley in the middle, Transjordan, Jordanian, um, uh, mountains, and then you have the eastern desert, nothing but desert, desert, desert. Much of the Old Testament, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, Kings, I mean we could literally divide this study up into two halves but I'm hoping to cover some of this when we look at the history all of that took place in this part of the world this whole thing right here all of that happened right here not only that but also the prophets Isaiah Jeremiah you know all of them Hosea Malachi they're 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 prophesying here how about the New Testament the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Jesus came from Galilee. Where is Galilee? It's up here to the north. Where is Jerusalem? It's down here. Where is Bethlehem? Seven miles to the south, right here. All this up and down. Where is Samaria? Samaria is in the middle, right here. We can look at some of these things when we do the history. Okay? Um, and then the book of Acts happened in Jerusalem. Church was founded here. James was the head of that church. He wrote the book of James probably from here. Maybe not from here. Maybe afterwards. Who knows? All right. So let's go to the second part, which is, I'll go back here. Egypt. I talked about Egypt a little bit. The land of slavery. The Greek historian Herodotus in 5th century B.C. called it the gift of the Nile. Why do you think the gift of the Nile? All you have here is desert. All you have here is desert. The only thing that keeps Egypt alive is this big, long river. The longest river in the world. I even put down some information for you. 4,145 miles in length. That's pretty long, folks. <laughs> and it's flowing which way? South to the north. 
It's the gift of the Nile. This is what keeps Egypt alive. By the way, I also put down there only 5% of the land in Egypt is agricultural. The rest of it is sand. It's desert, stone. That's it. And because of the river, you could not only irrigate your land, but also you could travel. This river was very important. And Egyptian, I'm not talking about Egypt as the Egypt today, but I'm talking about Egypt as in 4,000 years ago. 4,000 years ago. It's probably the, one of the oldest cultures next to, go back over here, this culture at the time known as the Sumerians. Again, I'm telling you, the names change. How many of y'all remember? Just and again, I'm just giving you information. Is that okay? Just just talking. Uh, when Abraham and Lot came into the Promised Land, those five kings came from the land of Shinar. Remember that the five kings came and they attacked the four kings. The king of Sodom was one of them. Shinar was also the name given to this land. So this land has had many names, many names. Okay. Going back to Egypt for just a few seconds. Its biblical name is Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is almost like a compound name. It's like two names put together. And they're talking about the upper Egypt and the lower Egypt. You'll find this interesting. You can use this on your friends at your, at your next party. Where is upper Egypt? Upper Egypt is actually on the bottom lower Egypt is on the top why do you think that's the case you already know the answer because the Nile River flows up so this from Memphis down is upper Egypt the head of the Delta up here is lower Egypt interesting but everything happened around here okay so this is uh, and I don't have time to go into much detail. Uh, at times, the Egyptian empire had two different pharaohs, one for the upper Egypt, another one for the lower Egypt. And you can see that reflected in their headdresses, their mitres. Have you seen pictures? Some of their mitres looks like this cone hat they're wearing. Other time, it looks like this, this almost like a chef's hat. And, and you're wondering, it's like, what's the difference? Do you like just have a special day where you wear the chef hat and another one? No, that's for upper and lower Egypt. And the one who controlled both upper and lower had both. So he had that almost like the Pope's hat and then had that cone shaped as well. That's how you can look at them in the hieroglyphs and say, that Pharaoh must have controlled both. This one must have controlled only the south, or this one must have controlled the north, or they must have controlled this for a brief time and then they lost it. This is how you tell, one of the ways you tell, just by, by the Pharaoh's mitre. Okay? The final chapters of Genesis and the opening chapters of Exodus took place here. So the people of Israel leaving Egypt, crossing the Red Sea. Now there's a big debate. Did they cross the Red Sea over here or did they cross the Red Sea over here? That's a big debate. Because if they're leaving Egypt, it takes a while for however many millions of people to cross the desert. But when you read the book of Exodus, it seems like overnight Pharaoh and his army is coming after them and they are standing by the shores of the Red Sea. How did they get there so quickly? So some people think more than likely it's up here. But up here, here's the problem. Today's Red Sea does not look that deep and does not look that wide. So the question is, it doesn't seem that miraculous. Now I have a solution for that and come back and I'll tell you. Anyway. Anyway, so these are, I just want to expose you to some of the issues people have to deal with, archaeologists especially, in what happened. Okay, so this is the Red Sea, if you can notice, coming up here. All right, there was other interaction with Egypt throughout Israel's histories. If you noticed, let me back up on this 
image for just a moment. Sorry, I have to do this again and again. Two groups of people were always fighting over who has the bigger land, Assyria and Egypt. If you read the Bible, they're constantly fighting. Who is going to get this land? So sometimes the king of Assyria is coming. Sometimes this Egypt is coming. And what would the kings in the south and the north do? They would try to make a little deal. Make a deal with Assyria. Make a deal with Egypt. And what did God tell them? Stop making deals. Trust me. Let me ask you something. If you were in that situation, what would you do? When you know Assyria is coming and they have this wonderful way of tying you up to their horses and pulling you apart, and Egypt says, be glad to help you, brother. Like, well, let's try. Let's, let's see if we can get their help. And God said, don't trust in Egypt. Don't go to Egypt. I will take care of you. So this, these two kingdoms constantly were vying for power, okay? So that tells you a little bit about that. So let me come out of there quickly. All right. Let me back up here. The reason I can do this, I'm doing it so well with this iPad, is that man back there, Patrick Newcomb. He is, he is a brilliant, he's a genius. He's helped me with all this. All right, so Christianity began to grow from here, from Jerusalem, all right, and began to spread. It went to Egypt, it went to Babylon, it went all over but guess where it really was accepted? Up to the north. Where we have Syria, modern day Syria, Lebanon. That's where people really loved Christianity. A lot of Jewish people were there. So through the synagogues, the gospel came and people just ate it up. And y'all remember in Acts chapter 11, verse 25, 26, what does it say? In Antioch, the believers were first called Christians. Isn't that sad that today in this part of the world, here's, here's Syria, Antioch, you can't even go there if you're a Christian. But this is where Christians were, we were first called Christians, this part of the world. All right, so let's, let's back up for a second. Phoenicia, this part of the world was known as Phoenicia, which is a name for some of the remnants of the Canaanites. And Syria is up here. It was ruled by the Assyrians. It was ruled by the Babylonians. It was ruled by the Persians. All tried to control Syria. Why Syria? Because, again, fert it was fertile. Best place to be. Damascus over here is not as fertile, but it's an oasis because of the melting snow that comes down these mountains and uh, so that's how it was important Abraham's servant was from here um, and all of that why else was Damascus important it's in your notes you can cheat Paul got what would you say Paul got lady at the well Oh, it's Samaria, Samaria. Samaria is further south. Uh, Damascus, uh, Paul on the road to Damascus. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that's where it's important. What happened afterwards? Did Paul ever go to Antioch of Syria? He did. Barnabas did too. So this is that part of the world. Christianity kept expanding. Now, what happened to Jerusalem here? If you remember, you know, persecution came and Christians had to run for their lives and they ran everywhere. Some went to Egypt, some went to Babylon. Others went to Asia Minor. This is up to the north. This is modern day Turkey. Again, sad to think about that Christianity is not welcome. But Turkey is, was known as Anatolia. Under the Greeks, Asia Minor and Cappadocia. Again, in the Byzantine Empire was known as that. It is surrounded by the Black Sea to the north. 
Agency, you can't see it over here unless I back up um, over here and the Mediterranean Sea to the south. You see this? Anything special about that place? Paul of Tarsus. This is where Paul was from. He was from Turkey, you can say. But isn't that amazing thing about that? Paul was from Turkey, but he, was, he got himself known in Jerusalem. He was a go-getter. He made himself famous as being the, you know, activist just by all he did. So, very important thing to keep in mind. Paul traveled all throughout this region of Galatia, Lystra, um, Antioch and Pisidia right here, Derby. And by the way, John, the revelator, wrote the book of Revelation, the, the letter to seven churches. Where are these seven churches found? They're found right here. This is where they are. And in his second missionary journey, let me see if I can go to the next. Oh, I want to go there. Paul went on to Greece, Macedonia. Y'all remember the Macedonian call? That came from there. The dream. All right, so that's where he goes. And the third missionary journey came around this way again. And his ultimate journey took him where? All the way to Rome. What happened? Did he ever leave Rome? We don't know. More than likely he was beheaded. We don't know. Does anybody have any questions before we look at our test passages? How about we look at some of these passages for a moment just to help you understand that when you know a little bit about the geography. It took me years to learn, and I'm still learning. But when you understand a little bit about the geography, it helps you appreciate the Bible even more. Okay? It really opens your eyes. It does for me. It does a lot for me. I, it, uh, it's almost like in my study, I kind of transport back in the time just, just by thinking about the land. To me, the land is important. Yes, sir. Yes. Right. It is. I mean, it's Napoleon when he came to Armageddon, because, you know, the French came there too. And he said, this is the perfect ground for a battle. And, and the Jezreel Valley is in front of you. All right. And you're standing up on the city of Ar Armageddon or Megiddo. And you look across, it's beautiful, it's lush. It is just perfectly laid out. You can see from miles to... And I wish I could have put some pictures, but this is a program where if I want to move to the map, I can't have the best of both worlds. I can either do PowerPoint or do this. But I wish I had some pictures. And you, it's, it's amazing how flat it is. Everywhere else is mountains, but here's just complete flat land. This is where the armies will gather. At least that's what the book of Revelation says. So, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 6. This was an easy one that I want us to understand the point of this passage. Somebody read it for us as loud as you can.
Okay, that, that's good right there. All right, so here are some questions tonight. After knowing what you know and what we've talked about, how do you appreciate this passage better? No right, wrong answers. I'm not expecting you to get into details of the topography or any of that. How do you appreciate this passage better? Anybody? Very good. <laughs> Here's a question. Here's a question. Let me follow up on that one. You're in your 60s. And God says, go to a land I will show you. Just start walking. How many of you are... <laughs> How many of y'all would leave everything to go to a land that God will show you one day? Just go. And take your wife. And take your wife. You have no kids, nothing, you know. <laughs> uh, and, a, and a nephew who's no good. Um, thank God for no good nephews, you know. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think one reason I think Abraham took Lot because he was thinking maybe he is the one. He wasn't the one. He was far from the one. But can you appreciate that a little bit? How far did these guys have to strap? All the way here and then end up here in Haran and then have to travel down here. Did you think they had to encounter difficulties? Yeah. Right. Something else, what else comes to your mind after just seeing this for a moment? What can you appreciate? No right, wrong answers. Right. Right. Isn't that how it's true for our lives? God calls you to the unknown, but most of the time, what do we do? No, I'm not going. I'm not going to follow through. I'm not going to obey God. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And we, Abraham became the father of the faithful. I mean, through him came the promise. But if he hadn't done this, we would have never heard of Abraham. Another thing that stands out to me is how the Bible is accurate. You know, when it says he left the Ur of the Chaldees, went up here to Haran, these places actually exist. Came down to Canaan, it exists. Many of the so-called religious books of other religions, they talk about a land that does not exist. They are myths and mythologies. Bible is a historical book. Now, it's not a book of history in, in the sense of it gives you everything like a history book today, but it, it is a historical book. It is set in history and you can trust it and geography helps you know that you see the pattern Ur, Heron coming down here to Canaan all right so there's some more things we can catch on but our time is very short Jeremiah 29 11 somebody read it for us
Okay. All right. So, how many of y'all have ever heard that verse before? All of us have heard. It's a powerful verse. It's a wonderful promise. Now, here's the question. Where did this take place? Where? I'm sorry? Babylon. So let's go to Babylon. That's where we are. Where is Israel? It's back here. What happened? The Babylonians came under Nebuchadnezzar, took these people, marched them across this desert, took them back to Babylon. Who were some of these people who were taken? Daniel, oh, come on back, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, these were some of those who were taken, and plus many, many other Jewish people, or people of Israel, really. And they were taken over here. So they are sitting here. What's going on with them? Why did God give this promise to them? You know, you've heard me preach on this, so some of y'all should be saying something. What was happening to these people? Nobody remember? Go ahead, Amy. Say it loud. They're in captivity, and what's happening? What were they doing? What would you do if you're in captivity and you're, they were mourning? Remember Psalm 137, verse 10? We hung our harps on the willow tree, and we're not going to sing anymore. Somebody made a song out of that by the rivers of Babylon. We're not going to sing anymore. They're asking us to sing. We have lost our music. We have no desire to sing. And so what is Jeremiah doing over here? Chapter 29, verse 1. Somebody read that verse for us. All right, so Jeremiah is writing this letter to the captives. Are you all having a tough time reading it? Should we turn the lights up a little bit? We can do that. All right, and you, he's, he's sending this letter to them. And what is he saying to them in this letter? Let me read it, and I want you to hear it, starting in verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from ba Jerusalem to Babylon. So God is saying, you know, the journey that you made, from, from Jerusalem all the way to Babylon, I made it happen. I put you in this situation. What's more, this is, listen to verse 5. Build houses and dwell in them. Stop talking about going back home. Build houses in Babylon. Live in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that you may bear sons and daughters that you may, not, you may be increased there and not diminished. Means what God is saying is, I put you in this predicament, burn your ships and plant yourself in the Babylonian soil. Stop talking about going home. You're not going home until I say so. See, so many people, what do they do is they never plant their feet anywhere. They're always going, one, one day we retire, we're going to move up over there in the mountains or somewhere. They're always moving somewhere. They're no good to anybody over there and they're no good to anybody here. They're, they're always in a state of flux. God is saying to you the same thing. Verse 7, and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away. See what God is saying is stop blaming the Babylonians and stop blaming your king and your leaders. I did it. I made this happen. So pay, pray for the peace of the city. And thus it says in verse 8, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. I mean, sometimes, folks, I am so amazed when people talk about, I feel like this is God's will. And they come up with some harebrained scheme and then it doesn't work out. And then they sit back and talk about, well, must not be, you know, I, and then they justify it. Whatever happened to saying, God, maybe you made this happen and I'm in this situation because of your plan? 
And then it says in verse 9, For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them. Stop listening to people who keep telling you, it's better over here. Come on, it's better over there. It's a greener grass. And then it says in verse 10, Thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know, this is where it comes in, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So yes, this is a wonderful verse to give to young people, to graduates, to somebody starting out in life. But remind them, sometimes what God wants you to do is not run, plant yourself. Dig roots. Buy some real estate. <laughs> Make it your home. We did that. Nicole and I did it several years ago. You know, we made that decision. We're done. This is our home. This is our home. This is where we're going to live. This is where we're going to grow old. This is unless Christ comes, this is the place, you know, we'll be buried. That's the decision we made. I don't know why people have a hard time understanding that. That's how God works. So when you're constantly running, you, you miss out on what's happening. No, sir. Yeah. I caused it. God says, I made it happen. Why are you blaming anybody? So anyways, does it, does it make sense how this... Knowing the geography helps you realize this is not just a random passage. It has some deep meanings, isn't it? Deep meanings. All right, stop blaming, start planting your feet. All right, let's go to uh, the, the New Testament. Let's get some examples from there. Somebody turn to Mark chapter 7 and somebody turn to Matthew chapter 15. Mark chapter 7 verses 24 through 29. Somebody find that one and somebody find Matthew 15 verses 21 through 28. So who has Mark chapter 7. All right, Lana, would you read it? Now, here's the question. The Bible tells us that he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Where is that? You see it up here? This is Tyre and Sidon. And she is known as a Gentile or a Greek. So more than likely, she's coming from some part of the world over there, living here. Okay? And it also, she's also known as a Syro-Phoenician woman. Remember we talked about Phoenicia and Syria? She's coming from this part of the world. Many different names are given to her. A Gentile, Greek, Syrophoenician. Bottom line is she doesn't belong to the people of Israel. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. So who has Matthew chapter 15? Verses 21 through 28. All right, go for it, Amy.
Okay, can you stop there for a second? Why in the world did Matthew, see how many of y'all actually listened to me, why in the world did Matthew say she was a Canaanite? Well, here's the question, folks. Were there even Canaanites by the time that Jesus was walking the streets of Palestine? <laughs> I mean, do we have colonists here? Any colonists? Any Virginian colonists, you know? Yes. Why did, why did Matthew say she was a Canaanite? That's right. What he's telling them is, remember how we used to look down on the Canaanites? She is like that. And yes, the Canaanites were, you know, kind of the early Phoenician mixture people from this part. Isn't that amazing how when you understand who Matthew, who was Matthew writing to? He was writing to the Jewish people. He's telling them, listen, we look down on these people. Mark was writing more to the Romans. So guess what he says? She was a Gentile. She was a Greek. In fact, that's a better way to translate. She was a Greek. And how did the Roman people look at, towards the Greeks? Man, they, they, they considered the Greeks to be up there because they've, they felt like, you know, the Greek culture, the ancient Greeks, the classical Greeks, they, you know, were such superior people. So Mark says Greek. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. What is Mark's purpose? He's talking to the Romans, and he, is, he presents her as a respectable person. Matthew is talking to the Jewish people, and he presents her as a despicable person. Isn't that amazing? Same incident, different audiences, different message. Yeah. Oh, yeah, let's, let's read that. Would you continue, please? Now, here's the question again. Does Jesus say this in the Gospel of Mark? Is there a statement about the lost sheep of Israel? It's not. Why, did, why didn't Mark include that? Because Mark is not writing to the Jewish people. It doesn't matter to the Romans. who Lost sheep of Israel, what is that? But the Jewish people, immediately it resonated with them. Oh, he's talking about us. We are the lost sheep of Israel. All right, please continue. Sorry, I keep interrupting you. All right, but how does, how does Mark say it? He says, for this saying, go your way. It may be variously translated in your version, but bottom line is that. Why did Jesus say, oh, woman? Women were also looked down upon, right? He's elevating her status. Oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. You see, knowing geography really helps, does it not? It does. The last one, I don't think we have time for that, but I want to encourage you in your home, in your Bible study, read the book of Acts, chapter 27. I've given the verses there. What is amazing, just don't miss this. What is amazing is that everything that Luke tells us, all the information that he gives us about this part of the world of um, of Greece and Rome, these islands actually exist and they're called by those names and that to me tells us that the Bible is the Word of God it is exactly historical and trustworthy does anybody have any questions before we close
or any comment for that matter. All right, so tonight we're giving away the Holman Bible Atlas. It's an awesome atlas. Who do we have today? I think Nicole is rigging it. Alice Pinnell, come on up. We signed you up. <laughs> you do know that once they get it, they don't get it again, right? So, so somebody, you get a lot of mean looks. <laughs> Y'all have a good night. Thank you.